All right, hey everybody. <laughs> nice to see everybody again. <laughs> it's been about four years. Went to Houston for pediatric surgery training and now I'm attending over at Rady. Um, but uh, my heart is still at Hillcrest. There'll be some more things. But um, so I just, uh, I'm slotted for an hour. This definitely won't take an hour, but I wanted to sort of, more importantly than this talk, just answer any specific questions you guys have. I mean, it's not uncommon for kids to roll into the Trauma Bay at Hillcrest. Um, you guys are like the number two if we're ever on uh, diversion. Um, so I think it's important that you guys are comfortable taking care of kids. I, I will say that uh, at least in my two years, at least a couple times a year, I'll get a call from somebody. It always happens to be Todd. I don't know why Todd's always on call, but it's always Todd or Laura. And uh, they have a kid and, you know, they have questions, do we scan them, do we not scan them, do we just send them to you and get rid of them? And I think those are all sort of appropriate things. And so, uh, is there anything just starting out that you guys have questions about or things that you want addressed? Don't be afraid to speak up. Yes, you are about to raise your hand. Well, I just think that um, if you have like a clear algorithm of like what to do with the applications. Yeah. Because I think it depends on who's in charge that day and how long they stay, if they get Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it, if we knew, so we weren't always like wondering like, if we are doing the right thing. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think pediatric trauma like, is scary and intimidating. I'll go into a little bit of that because you don't want to hurt a kid or do the wrong thing or do the wrong medicine or do the wrong test or whatever. I think the more uncomfortable the situation is, the more important it is to have algorithms. The tough thing is, you know, you can't recreate the whole trauma handbook for a pediatric patient. We think you guys could have some recent guidelines to follow. But, you know, I will say after having um, gone to Houston and then being at Rady now, it's amazing how variable care can be from attending to attending, training to training. We're very, we're very lucky at Hillcrest that these are so protocolized, probably because uh, Dr. Barber was such a strong personality and everything just happened the way he wanted yeah, the way he wanted it but um, but that's actually a pretty rare circumstance uh, but it would be nice for you guys to have just some basics the scaffolding problem. but I'll, I'll sort of talk to you a little bit about you know head injury c-spine belly injury and a little bit about child abuse and uh, I'll talk about the literature and at least some of the kind of basic standards that we follow in the feel free to stop or interrupt me uh, okay so a couple of disclosures. I have no financial disclosures, at least not this time. But I will say that 99% of what I do know about trauma, I learned at my, my adult training here at Hillcrest, and then that last 1% is what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today. Um, I wanna go over uh, the primary and secondary surveys in the pediatric patient. Most of them are the same, there's some subtle differences, and then talk about those things that happen before. Uh, and my hope is at the end of this, maybe you guys can gain a little more comfort uh, and caring for kids, or at the very least, not being quite as um, thrown off the next time a kid goes into your child. So there is definitely a fear of the pediatric patient. I think <laughs> I felt this as a resident. We heard there was a, a two-year-old coming in, and everybody like freaked out. Everyone gets stressed out. You think the kids are gonna you're gonna break the kid or hurt the kid? They're gonna be screaming. Are they screaming because they're just a kid? Are they screaming because they have? traumatic injury, how do I figure that out, how do I tell the difference, you know, what medications can I prescribe, what's safe for a kid, can I give a kid morphine, can I give a kid propofol, what can I do, and then what tests do we run, do we, I don't want to scan a kid and give the kid cancer, but I also don't want to miss something, what do I do, and so my talk is hopefully to alleviate some of this fear. Fortunately, most of the anatomy and physiology in kids is the same. Like I said, 99% is really the same as adults. For the most part, you'd be safe if you treat your kid like an adult, at least in a primary, secondary survey, and some of the initial um, I'm going to sort of structure my talk around a case. So we'll say Johnny, the staff was Pete's versus Auto at 20 miles per hour. Let's say he was, he was walking down the street in PB and somebody pulled out of an alley um, and hit him. Uh, and uh, the report you get from um, uh, EMS is that there was loss of consciousness, the kid has a, the patient has a cephalohematoma, vitals are normal, and the treatments they put a seat collar on and they started to 
So what do you want to do first? First, I want to know his age and what yeah. color he's on the, the bottom. All right. We'll get there in a minute. <laughs> but more importantly than that, what's the first thing we do in the trauma? <laughs> right. So a primary survey, right? Airway breathing circulation, right? Standard. So it's the same for a three-year-old as a 23-year-old. Airway breathing circulation. When I think about it, I just say the kids are small adults. You know, in all of our training, we say kids are not just small adults. But when it comes to trauma in the primary survey, they're just small adults. They do the same stuff. They do have some subtle differences, um, and we'll talk about those and why you seem to change things a little bit. But for the most part, airway breathing circulation. Okay, so we're going to come up with two patients, two Johns. One is a 23-year-old. They <laughs> said it was PB, right? One is a three-year-old. So the primary survey. Yeah. I thought it was not. All right, primary survey. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to assess the airway? Is he talking? How are we going to assess breathing? Okay, pillars one, chest expansion, those are listen and auscultation, very good. Circulation, feel for a pulse. Disability, yeah, so, is it, so GCS is the appropriate, moving all four extremities, and exposure, you know, stripping them down, keeping them warm, all that stuff, right? Okay, so that's all the stuff we just said, that standard stuff. What about in a kid? Okay, so a kid, so one of the subtle differences in the primary survey is the kid, they may not be able to follow commands. They may not be able to answer questions, either because they can't, because they're a one-year-old and they can't verbalize or they don't want to. They're a three-year-old and they're afraid and they're shy and stuff. So you have to do a lot more veterinary medicine. You have to observe them. You may need to stimulate them to prove that they're protecting their airway. Listening is the same. Feeling for a pulse, a lot of times the radial pulse is very subtle, in a, especially in a small kid and in the business of the trauma bay can be tough to feel, so go for the brachial pulse. That's a lot more reproducible. Um, for disability, the GCS score is slightly different. We'll talk about that. That also has to do with their verbal um, skills and their ability to communicate, um, and exposure is the same. And the secondary survey is pretty similar. The one exception I'll say is we rarely do rectal exams on patients in pediatrics. It's just a little traumatizing, both for the practitioners and for the kids. Um, so we tend to, to defer that. Are they still doing a lot of that in the trauma yeah, business? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they just changed. Fantastic. Did you get a question? Do you put the patient in the seat collar and on the backboard? Most patients, well, it's extremely variable. So some patients come to us on a seat collar and a backboard. A lot of kids, if they're really small, they're actually safer in a car seat. So they'll strap a, they'll either strap a collar on and put them in a car seat, or if it's not really compatible with the car seat, They'll strap them to the car seat, and then they put a piece of tape around their head in the car seat. Um, I think, and I'll get into this about C-spine management, but most C-spine management, most kids are cleared clinically. A big theme of my talk is going to be like, don't scan kids. Scanning is bad. We overscan. You don't need to overscan. You just need to be a good clinician, a good practitioner. Um, so some kids do come in a seat collar. If they don't come in a seat collar, if it's um, depending on their GCS, the severity of the mechanism, I may have them strap a collar on the kid, or I may have just somebody hold them um, in inline immobilization until I can assess the kid's C-spine and then clear But we'll get to that in a moment. That's a great question. I appreciate you asking. Okay, so primary survey, why, is, why some differences? We talked about some of the GCS stuff, but as far as the airway, kids have bigger heads in proportion to their body, so they tend to be more flexed, so they tend to close off their airway more. They have more soft tissue in their oropharynx, so they tend to obstruct more. And then their airways are more anterior, so if the first two things lead the kid to not be protecting their airway after an injury, intubating can be much more difficult. You may have to use your adjuncts like a jaw thrust, like a nasal trumpet, like, a, like an oral airway, things like that, um, and then intubating. When we intubate, obviously, you, you mentioned the, the Braslow earlier, so everybody here knows what Braslow tape is, right? It's fantastic. It kind of tells you everything, not just meds and normal vitals, but also tube sizes for whatever you're going to do. It'll tell you what ET tube size, but the basic rule that most people use is age over 4 plus 4, so if the kid's a 4-year-old, put a size 5 ET tube, et etc. et cetera. Um, if you haven't intubated, I mean, this is sort of maybe beyond the scope of 
of you guys, but a good thing to know is when a kid comes in, you definitely want to consider using a glide scope to intubate, especially if you haven't intubated kids very much, because it is very anterior, so you may want to make sure the glide scope is available for whoever's running the trauma. Um, for these kids, breathing, uh, listening to breath sounds is pretty much the same, but unlike adults, most adults get into trouble. Uh, most co common cause of arrest is hypovolemia in adults and kids. It's not hypovolemia, it's hypoxia. So these kids can get hypoxic and then they just crumb. So just keep that in mind. You really want to support their breathing, circulation, normal vital signs, just refer to your Roslo. Um, and then uh, one sort of rule of thumb I use is the minimum systolic pressure should be 70 plus the H times 2. So in a five year old, it should be around 80. Uh, and then so disability, GCS, this is really small and you guys are sitting like so far away. So eyes are pretty much the same. A motor response, instead of uh, obeying commands, we just look for normal movements. A lot of times they can't obey commands. I don't even know what they um, And then for verbal, uh, we're looking for sort of normal sounds, similar to an adult, but they're not going to be talking to normally. They're going to be cooing or babbling or whatever the case might be. Um, Instead of disor taking a point off for disorientation or repetitiveness, we just do it for crying or irritability, um, and then so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, hopefully this is on the Roslo or in the handbook somewhere. All right, so let's go back. So now you've done your primary and your secondary, and you find out that he did have a loss of consciousness. There is a cephalohematoma, but GCS is 15, and he's got some abrasions up and down. So our two Johnnies. What workup are we doing for the 23-year-old John? Head CT, right? First thing, head CT. Can't get away from a head CT unless you come to read. Okay, so a head CT, what else? CT C-spine, right? You gotta look at the C-spine. What else? Chest, pelvis. Chest, pelvis. You guys want to evaluate the belly? Fast. Fast, right? And now you guys have fast 24-7, right? I mean, three years ago, four years ago, we didn't have fast 24-7. And after 11 p.m. when the fast sonographer was gone, we would scan all these patients, right? That's true, right? Yeah. A little well, history lesson. And then labs. You guys want to get some labs? Yeah. Why not? It's just a needle. No big deal. Okay. So, in a three-year-old, I'm basically, the rest of my talk, I'm going to convince you that you don't need any of that stuff. We'll tell you guys later on when was three it's going to be a big change, shift in thinking. We don't need any of that stuff. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about traumatic head injury. We'll talk about head first and then see spine and belly. So it's uh, the leading cause of trauma death in kids, um, and it's the leading cause of trauma in kids. Head trauma annually results in 6,000 deaths, pediatric deaths a year, 60,000 hospitalizations, and 600,000 ED visits. Of those 600,000 ED visits before 2010, before we sort of shifted the way we managed these kids, 50% of those kids got head CTs. So that means 300,000 head CTs were performed every year. And you can fall into either one of two camps. You can say, yes, we are doing a great job at screening for head injury. This is awesome. This is wonderful. Or you can be appalled by this thing and say, how can we be subjecting all these children to ionizing So, the arguments for the liberal use of heads and feet, scanning everybody with a loss of consciousness, is you're not going to miss anything. Um, and TBI is the most common injury in kids, so why not scan everybody, right? Kids also are pre-verbal or non-verbal. They can't communicate or they don't want to communicate to you. So just scan them all. The argument against that is that it's low yield. So even though head injury is the most common injury, really having a finding on a CT scan is pretty rare, less than 10% of the time. Most centers, like, have you, you, we have a CT scanner outside of the trauma bay yet or not? No. Yeah. Still going down in the basement, around a million different corridors, and all that stuff. <laughs> right? So that's, and that's the way it is at most pediatric centers, too, although that's changing, just as in adult centers. But there's risk with transport, especially in an unstable patient. Many kids need sedation to get images, to get them to sit still. So are you going to take a kid who you're worried about a head injury and start to sedate them just to get pictures? Like, that seems stupid, right? Um, there's a cost, and then there's radiation. And the radiation is not minimal. And there's two variables that make a CT scan much more dangerous for my three-year-old than for me. And so one is that my three-year-old, hopefully, 
she'll live another 80 years, you know? I'm gonna live another 40 years, the fallen Kumin, who knows, right? <laughs> so uh, there's a lot more years for those malignant changes to, to take place. The second thing is that kids have a much higher metabolism. Their cells are much more active, they're dividing more often. With those divisions, you, you hit it with ionizing radiation, you're much more likely to have some sort of error division and need their malignant scan. So those are the two reasons why CT scans, radiation in general for kids is bad. So, Lifetime risk of cancer death from a head CT for a one-year-old is one in 1,500. For a 10-year-old, it's one in 5,000. Those kids are somewhere in between that present to us, right? And that's a lot. That's not nothing. And remind me, how many annual head CTs are we doing a year? So, so 600,000 kids are presenting, 300,000. Let's say most kids are somewhere in the middle of that. So let's say there's three th one in 3,000 gets a has a death from malignancy, so that's 100 a year. That's a lot for a test that may or may not be needed to help manage the patient. So that's not good. So a bunch of people got together and they said, that's not good. And they said, how do we figure out how to weigh these risks and benefits? Uh, the benefits of scanning and really identifying injury versus the risks of radiating a kid and really not finding anything if nothing's there. And so they came up with uh, a trial that was a multi-center trial called the PCARN study. And this is like one of like just two or three things I want you guys to take away from this, is PCARN. Burn that word into your head, PCARN, you can Google it. I'll show you a link where you can go to like online, a little calculator, you click two buttons and you decide if a kid needs a CT scan or not. Very, very simple. So they wanted to find a clinically, clinically easy tool to um, determine if a kid needs a head CT. And why would a kid need a head CT? Would they need a head CT if there's like a little bleed that's never gonna need a difference in management, craniotomy, hypertonic? It doesn't really matter, right? All that really matters is, is if you have something that requires intervention. There's probably a ton of people walking around who have head bleeds all the time from like concussions in football, falling, fights, whatever. They don't come to our trauma bay, but they're just fine. They're not like family members aren't finding them dead on the couch the next day. They just have a little bleed and they survive. And I know that's, for me, that was a hard thing to understand, you know, because we see, you know, all these horribly morbid head bleeds that roll into Pocrest. But the truth is that you can have TBI and then you can have really clinically significant TBI. And so that's what these authors were trying to delineate. So they defined that um, as a death, something that needed neurosurgical intervention, like a bolt or a crany. Uh, if they need to be intubated because their GCS was so depressed, or if they're in the hospital for more than two days. And otherwise, like, who cares if you find a head bleed? Like, what's the difference? You know, is it worth radiating a kid just so that you feel better that you know it's there? So they basically had an algorithm. They had 40,000 patients, four fifths of them um, they studied, and then one fifth they used um, as a uh, as a validation group. And they looked at all these different variables for kids that could communicate above two, and kids that couldn't, less than two. And then they had some algorithms. So I don't think you guys are going to be able to see this. But basically, if you have a normal GCS, or if you have an abnormal GCS, or if you're altered, or if you have a skull fracture, you need a head CT. The chance of having a significant TBI is 4 to 5 percent. So you need a CT, right? But if your GCS is normal and you're not altered, you don't have a skull fracture, even if you had a loss of consciousness or you're puking or whatever, um, then you look at a bunch of other variables and then you decide. And um, I won't go through all the variables, but basically you can decide based on this study if the kid needs a head CT. Even if they lost consciousness, even if they had a by a car, even if they're a kid, extremes of age. I like that she corrected an indication for a CT scan is extremes of age, it's really just old age, not young age, because it's definitely not how we treat kids. Um, but why don't we take a second, let me see if this, uh, and then they validated it, it's like super sensitive, super specific, you almost miss nobody, and then a lot of other centers have validated it. Uh, so, and then I'll show you the tool in a minute, but again, LOC, Cephalematoma, but acting normally, do you need a head CT in a three-year-old? No. Okay, good. And then this is the calculator. Let me see if this works, because this will be worth everybody's time. You can Google it and I'll try it. Oh, perfect. 
Okay. So, wait, how do I... Okay, let's move on to C-Spines. So C-Spine, how are we doing on time? Good, I got a thumbs up. All right, C-Spines. So, it's really, really rare in kids to have a C-Spine injury. Like, really rare. Kids are pretty flexible. They tend not to have C-Spine injuries. We'll get into what injuries they do have, if they have them. Uh, it's only happens one or two percent of the time in really severe blunt trauma. Most of the time, kids with severe blunt trauma, it's an MDA, and they're strapped into a car seat, and they're not going to get injured. It's not their C-spine. They're very well protected. Uh, this is what it looks like if you try to put a seat collar on a kid. It's all over the place. None of them fit. The kid hates it. They're screaming. They're crying. It's upside down. The nurses put it back on wrong on the floor. It's not worth doing in most cases. Kids less than eight, um, they are, they can be susceptible to C-spine injuries. They tend to be higher up. Their heads are bigger, so there's more weight higher up on the C-spine, so that fulcrum um, is higher up. And then they tend to not have bony injuries. They tend to have more ligamentous injuries. You know, kids, they just don't, you know, their, their bones, they bend, they don't break. They're not completely as ossified as adults are. They have more cartilage to support them. And so they tend to have more ligamentous injuries, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but but C-spines don't really assess for ligamentous injuries. So uh, that's my first uh, advertisement to not scan, but it's a real lot of C-spine injury. So those who argue, again, for liberal use of CT scans, you don't want to miss anything. Kids can't talk. Um, we're super uncomfortable with kids. Arguments against, against it. It's most of the injuries are ligamentous. It's not going to find those. Um, it's a significant cost, and there's a lot of radiation. Basically, the radiation numbers are the same, which I'll put somewhere. You know, and these are also reasons we don't want to radiate kids, right? They live longer, higher metabolisms. And then the cancer risks are essentially the same. That's mostly thyroid, skin cancer, and lymphoma. Uh, uh, so most kids don't need radiographic evaluation, and this. When I initially, when I first came here, uh, Jeannie Lee asked me to talk at the Tuesday trauma conference. And instead of God here, I had a line crossed out and I wrote Coimbra. Because um, <laughs> that's how I always felt. I felt like I would get, you know, just raked over the coals if we didn't, you know, scan everybody for a season. Rarely, sometimes, we can do sort of the three view thing in the trauma bay and you have the swimmers you can never see C7 on the T1 and all that kind of stuff. And then you send them for a scan anyways, which is stupid. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to make this argument, and it's based on the Nexus criteria. So the Nexus was a huge study of both adults and children, many, many, many centers, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of patients. And they, they came up with these criteria, basically how we clear C-spines. Uh, for us, it's up front with kids. In adults, it tends to be after we get a CT scan, we clinically clear in the next day to take the collar off, right? And so we're making sure they have no midline tenderness, they have good range of motion without pain, they have no focal neurologic deficit that makes us think they have a cord injury, they're awake, they're alert, they're not wasted, and they have no distracting injury, right? And then we can take the collar off. But we do that up front without the CT scan. And this was based on a, on a series of 3,000 kids, and that had 1% C spine injuries, and it was almost perfect. So you can't see this, but this is our C-spine protocol at Radio. And this is what is at the big trauma centers for pediatrics. And this is gonna blow your mind. Okay, so we do the nexus thing. We, we clear them in the trauma bag. Let's say they can't be cleared. Right? Let's say they have midline tenderness. So we leave the collar on or we put a collar on. And then what should we do? Scan them, right? No, we don't scan them. We get a lateral C just to make sure there's no horrible step offs or anything. Lateral C, and then we let them chill out for a few hours. Right, they're all worked up from the accident, there's a bunch of strangers. Now we've done our primary or secondary, mom has been able to come in, calm the kid down, the kid's had a popsicle, we reevaluate. Then we can clear them. Most of the kids can be cleared at that point. That's great, collar comes off, no radiation, no cancer down the road. Let's say they're still tender after a few hours. Lateral C spine's negative. Then what do we do? Okay, MRI is one option. What else? I like that nobody's saying CT scan. That's great. <laughs> Our job is done. Well, I would have thought scan them. 
MRI or CT? MRI, you know, you have a tech. Most of these kids are going to move for the 45 minutes of the scan. You're going to have to sedate them for that. So there's, there's some benefits of that. So, but actually what we do is we just send kids home with a collar. They have parents. They will. They're not like the 23-year-old PB guy. As soon as he gets home, he's taking that off. In the Hillcrest parking lot, he's taking that off. But these kids have parents. You think that mom is going to let that kid take the collar off? No way. No way. They keep it on for two weeks, and they go to ortho clinic. And then, then they're clear. So that's the hotness. That's how we take care of kids with C-spine injury. Now, if that lateral C-spine shows an injury, or if their GCS is less than perfect, or if they have focal neural deficit, or if something else is off, sure. Then we scan them. Most of the time, actually, we don't do a CT. We tend to do the MRI. We tend to sedate them, because at that point, it's probably worthwhile. We're probably going to find something significant. But that's what we do. So try to clear them clinically. Most kids clear clinically done. No CT scan. They can't be clear clinically, collar on, lateral C-spine, give them a few hours, let them chill out with mom. Reassess, most of them, collars can come off, they're done. Those that can't, go home with the collar. No CTs. That's our opportunity. That's the algorithm in Cincinnati and Kansas City, and really, really good for the other Okay, so we said, for the 23-year-old, we're gonna have the hill press, we're gonna do CT head, CT C-spine. We're going to do a fast, chest x-ray, pelvic x-ray, labs. And for little Johnny, three-year-old Johnny, we're not going to do a head CT and we're not going to do a C-spine CT. Right? Right. Okay. What about evaluating his belly? So um, solid organ injury uh, is pretty common in kids. And most for most stuff in pediatric trauma and pediatric surgery, we uh, let the world experiment on adults first. And then once it's proven to work in adults, then we apply it to kids. We don't like experimentation on kids. The exception happens with solid organ injury. So in kids, it's thought that their immune systems aren't as good. If they have a splenic injury and we have to do a splenectomy, the kids are more at risk for having infection post-op. They can live longer without a spleen and all that stuff. So the thinking in pediatrics, this is back in the 80s and 90s, was let's just watch these kids, transfuse them a couple times, and see if we can get away without taking out their spleen. And lo and behold, we could. And then we did the same thing for liver injury, kidney injury, and it turns out it worked great for kids, and then the adults started doing the same thing. It works well in adults. And when's the last time, maybe it was recent, but I don't know, when's the last time you guys did a splenectomy? Okay. Was it recent? A while ago? You know, remember one? Pretty rare. When's the last time you guys did, had a splenic lap in the ICU at Oak Crest? Yeah. Last week. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's that. So, um, I think that becomes my second bullet point. Uh, as far as working kids up, that's not based on mechanism or based on the fact that they are a trauma. It's based on how they look clinically and what their labs and their x-rays are. And that's what most places do. So, um, and CT, unfortunately, is still the gold standard for that. Fast in kids is good in older kids, but the problem with fast, so how does fast, what are we looking for in a fast? Fluid, right? So in a three-year-old, compared to a 23-year-old, are you looking for the same amount of fluid? Any fluid? Probably a smaller amount of fluid in a three-year-old is more significant than an older patient. But also the ultrasound just aren't as sensitive to pick up a significant amount of fluid in a three-year-old. It's just not going to see it. Uh, we're not going to know what to do based on that information. So for that reason, FAST hasn't really caught on to kids. Although I love it because I've been trained here, but it's just not great for younger kids. For teenagers, kids have gone through puberty, it's fine. Um, and then now we sort of OBS patients. The other thing we do in kids, uh, we weren't doing it at Hillcrest, at least when I finished, was kids with like a low grade splenic lack, like a one or two, just go to the floor. Uh, at Hillcrest, everybody with any little blip of anything is in the ICU. So I don't know, I don't want to comment on that. But in kids, it's safe to put them on the floor. They're fine. And I don't know how many times a grade one or grade two splenic lack has become unstable in the unit. I'm guessing it's probably like a patient you guys all want, because they're like the easiest patient of the night. Uh, but 
Yeah. So at least we do that in kids. Maybe that'll, that'll permeate within the adult world at some point. I think part of the fear is that we don't yeah. put pediatrics on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> right, bad. but I mean adults. <laughs> no, but what about an adult with a grade one spot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah well, why do they know so? Okay, and how often do you have to transfuse them? Very often. So, I don't know. Some of the thing, we, kids, we don't do that. ICUs are bad places, a lot of bugs, a lot of oversticking, a lot of over triage. Um, so, we try to avoid that. Um, this, is, this was a multi center study that I really like, that a lot of people really like, and it determines how to figure out if a kid needs a, a belly CT. And it's based on five criteria. And these are all five criteria that you can figure out in your trauma bay um, if you're a little bit patient. And then you can decide if you need to go on to a CT. So the first is if they complain of abdominal pain. So if they're saying that their bellies are hurting, then I'll just point out what these numbers mean. So that was 21% of the study population, 25% or a little more um, of kid, people complaining of abdominal pain had an intra-abdominal injury. But only 6% of those had an intra-abdominal injury that required intervention. But still, that's pretty significant. So if they have abdominal pain, if they have an abnormal abdominal exam, so they have, they're tender, they're distended with blood, or bowel gas, uh, if they have a seatbelt sign, then that's significant. Uh, if they have an abnormal chest x-ray, and that says that there's been a lot of blunt force trauma to the torso, so it's a fractured ribs, a cortical fusion, things like that, um, they're more likely to have an intra-abdominal injury. If they're AST, so if one of their liver enzymes is not just a little elevated, but significantly elevated, 200, we'll scan them. And if they have an abnormal pancreatic enzymes, like white base ring, we'll scan them. And we basically figure out all these things in the trauma bay. We send the labs off, we wait the half hour for them to come back, and then we decide on whether or not to CT. Um, because again, CT scans are better. Okay. Um, and if they don't have any of those, the chance of actually needing an intervention in this study of many institutions, thousands of kids, was zero. They don't have any of those five things. The chance of them actually needing a doctor or a nurse or an ICU bed or an operating room was zero. So what's the point of scanning just to make us feel better? Okay, let's talk about child abuse for a minute, non-accidental trauma. It's surprisingly uncommon here in San Diego, maybe because everybody's happier here in San Diego. <laughs> And it's sunnier, and it's wonderful, and parents don't get stressed out. But in Houston, where I trained, I'll tell you, it was all the time. Several times a week, we were admitting kids with NAT. It was constant. People were very unhappy. I don't know. Um, but to talk a little bit about the epidemiology, it's very common. Less than three-year-old kids, it's 25% of the trauma cases, but a significant number of the deaths. Um, most of the deaths, there's a parent involved, which is sad. Uh, but it speaks to the fact that you really can't trust anybody. And you have to, my, my whole point with everything else, the first part of my talk was uh, don't scan kids. This part of my talk is don't trust parents. So, so always have child abuse in the back of your mind when you're dealing with a kid. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll, we'll talk about sort of the things to think about. Uh, it is a challenging diagnosis to make because uh, the patients oftentimes can't or won't provide a history, so it's tough um, to really know what's going on. The exam findings can be subtle, and the injuries, although they can suggest it, they're never you know, at the line. They're never like, oh, absolutely, this is a child abuse injury, not from, from some. You know what I mean? So, um, and also, it's, you know, I think as humans, we want to like, give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't want to believe that like the kid's being abused. And these parents who seem perfectly normal and like loving right in front of this kid, there's no way they can be the, the cause of this injury. Um, so I think all that sort of has an interplay that leads, leads it to be a challenging diagnosis. So one thing is, as far as taking the history, so you want to look at injuries that don't match up with the mechanism. So if the parents report that they, they rolled out of a bed and they broke a femur, that's unlikely, right? So that's one thing to keep an eye on. Second one is inconsistent stories. So anybody who comes to the bedside, you want to ask them what happened, how it happened, and if the stories are inconsistent, that's a red flag. If they come in uh, and the injury happened six hours ago, but they have reliable transportation and there's no reason it shouldn't, they shouldn't have come right in, that's another red flag. 
and if they've had multiple injuries in the past, that's another red flag. So if they've shown up to the hospital several times before with various broken bones, that's something else to take pretty seriously. On exam, we're looking for looking for patterns of bruising. Bruising that's uh, not over bony prominences. So kids fall all the time. My two kids fall all the time. I always worry that they're going to end up in the emergency room with bruises all over them, and I'm, they're going to start an AT workup on my kids, <laughs> right? But the bruising should be patterned. So it should be over bony prominences, like they fall on their knees or their elbows or their head. It shouldn't be in places that are sort of soft and squishy. And so if they are in areas that are soft and squishy, like the belly, like the lower back, like the backs of the thighs, like the arm, where a parent would grab a kid, um, those are things that should sort of um, trigger you to start thinking about NAT. Burns, so you guys see, I mean, you guys see all the burns here, right? And this is like difficult stuff to think about, but some kids are forcibly submersed um, under really, really hot water um, as a mechanism of NAT. And the things that are classic with that, so they get sparing of a couple areas. One is like the soft tissue folds of their belly when they're stretched up, and you can see that on the bottom, the left image on the bottom right. And then the other is where their, their bottoms are pressed against the bottom of the tub, that's actually spared also, and so their bottoms are not. That's a very classic pattern for burns. Other injuries, um, so uh, rib fractures, particularly posterior rib fractures from grabbing a baby and the fingers kind of go around the back and exert force in the posterior ribs, that's what that um, x-ray is, these are posterior rib fractures. If they have fractures in different parts of their body, that should tip you off. If you find fractures that are in various stages of healing, so it's something that is all healed, it's something, an old fracture that's kind of healing, now a new fracture, that should also tip you off that this could be an AT. Uh, and then with head injury, bilateral subdurals are very uncommon with pediatric trauma, but they are common with NAT. Uh, Nonlinear fractures um, are common also, and then retinal hemorrhage is the big one, that's the one that's really hard for parents to hide from us. So if they're shaken, they start to get hemorrhages on the back of the retina. Um, we look for that too. Uh, and in the abdomen, they can have um, duodenal injuries, pancreatic injuries, liver injuries from, from blows, blows to the back. Uh, what's the workup? So we do scan these kids. We do get CT heads on them. And then if they have an abnormal finding, we typically have opto look um, for retinal hemorrhages. Uh, we do a skeletal survey, so we just get plain films the whole body top to bottom to look for other acute injuries and also old healing fractures. Uh, labs, ASTALT to look for liver trauma, live case to look for pancreas trauma, D-dimer we found at Rady is a very sensitive marker for head trauma. Uh, looking at CBCs to rule out chronic anemia because a lot of these kids have been neglected and malnourished. Same with coags, could be from neglect and malnourishment. Some of these kids actually, they're thought to be NAT but then they we find they have an underlying problem, like rickets, and they just break the bones easily, or they have an underlying coagulopathy, like hemophilia, and then and these tests help with that. Uh, we get social work involved in the child protective team, which is essentially a uh, social worker, an MD familiar with NAT, uh, and then we work closely with CPS uh, and our general counsel uh, to help hopefully separate parents and body. Okay, so in summary, for the whole talk. Primary and secondary surveys, um, that's what we do in pediatrics. They're pretty much the same. There's some subtle differences. Uh, CT scans are bad. Um, really be thoughtful about your CT scans. Remember the PCARN thing. It's so easy to, to Google, to look up, and it's so useful. Uh, most kids can be cleared clinically for their C-spine injuries if they are GCS 15. Abdominal injury, um, we use CT scans, but only if they have an abnormal history, exam, LFTs, light case for chest x-ray, if all those are normal, push to hold off on the CT scan. Uh, most uh, solid organ injuries can be avoided. And NAT is very common and you always have to have it in the back of your mind. Don't be afraid to engage your social worker um, to have them start screening for you. And these are my two favorite pediatric patients. <laughs> All right, what questions do you guys have? There are no dumb questions. Nothing? I've answered I all of your questions. She has a question. So when you, when you guys have a pediatric patient come in in a car seat, let's say they were in a motor vehicle accident. Yes. Do you do their assessment 
the patient in the car seat or do you take them out of the car seat? Right. I think you could do either one. Um, I have done either one. Uh, I think if it's, um, I tend to take the kid out of the car seat. So I have someone hold C-spine from above and then I have, uh, you know, another nurse or me hold the baby from below, we levitate the baby and then we pull the car seat out. I think it's perfectly safe to take the kid out of the car seat. I think it's hard to do a primary, you know, they're not gonna take deep breaths to listen to their breathing. It's hard to get at them. Plus, you guys can't start your stuff like I do and putting leads on. It makes it very difficult. So most of the time, I just take it. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. It's great to be back. Yes, go for it. So when you put on bypass, yes. does that mean that your is on bypass? No. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Does that mean that we, because we have an incident where we had a pediatric patient yeah. that we had so bypass, trauma. right? So normally bypass means bypass for trauma. I suppose our ED can go on bypass. But that would be oh, crazy. So bypass it's normally for trauma, which means all of our trauma bays are full, or um, the CT scanner is down, uh, or there's a mass casualty we're expecting. I think other reasons we go on bypass. How many trauma bays do we have? two trauma bays, and we will open up two adjacent rooms, um, uh, just regular exam and just trauma bays. So you could still take admission, though, if you're on trauma bypass? Yes. You would still be able to take admission from our trauma bay. Right. Now, the problem is, so here's the problem. The problem is that uh, uh, there are all these protocols. And these protocols probably got written sometime around like 1900 or something. So they're like really old and kind of antiquated. And they were written at a time where um, the trauma system was evolving here in San Diego. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think because of that, they were trying to make everything really firm and rigid and like they want to put everything in a box and make it easy for people to follow protocols, which I understand. But now everybody's pretty comfortable with, oh, we have the trauma system. And, catchment areas, and this is how things flow. And, and so anyways, any trauma that was transferred to us had to come through the trauma bed. It had to be a full activation. Couldn't be just, let's just transfer them to the ED, have the ED accept them, and have the trauma doc evaluate them as a console. That's gonna change in the next three to six months for us. Thank God. But, so in that scenario, if we're on full bypass, and you guys have a trauma patient, it's gonna be difficult to transfer that trauma patient is that patient has to come as an activation. But that should change. And we should be able to say, okay, let's just see the kid in the ED. Or let's just see the kid before we figure it out. So I have a question. So if Chet comes to pick up, we have a sense of how to pick up a kid. Pretty much they didn't want to hear what we had to say. Yeah. But are they, is that in their mindset? Are they just treating them like, a 911 call and just taking the kid. I think so. I think that they. Um, I mean, we had done stuff with this kid, and you, know, you right. don't want to put a kid through more than they need to be put through. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I can't comment on that specific episode. No, but I, just mean, I think in general, some of them are better than others. They're all fantastic practitioners yeah. clinically, um, but I think they're used to you know going out to like. Raleigh and you know, Centro and wherever else and picking up kids and having people have no idea. So it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what the report is. They just need to like scoop up the kid and come back. You know, obviously here at Hillcrest, like, you guys are baller, you know what's going on, <laughs> what you guys can say has significant value. And so I don't know, maybe they were just in the mindset of scooping them up. But I, I'll tell you, so when I run a trauma, at Rady, it is like identical, with, with one or two exceptions, to a Hillcrest trauma. Mm -hmm. I run it the same exact way. You know, the EMS come like running in the door, and all everyone in the room is super hyped and ready to do their job and put things on and oxygen. And I say, whoa, whoa, whoa let's take your report before we transfer over, so everyone can listen. I do all that stuff. I do all the mindset. But anyways, my point is, is that I personally believe that the report is very, very important because I was trained here and I was beaten into us. And I use my BT <laughs> in the presentation because that's like in my head. Um, 
but that may not be for everybody. Okay. So, so give him a pass. No, no, because I'm wondering what the mindset was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you cut the clothes of the kid? Like, is it traumatic? Great question. Great question. So we tend to not cut clothes if possible. We tend to look under clothes. Uh, for, for pants, um, we, we sort of use our judgment a lot, so we don't think there's a high likelihood of a spine injury. We will take the pants off before evaluating the T's and L's. Or I'll do everything except for the looking at the panted areas, um, and then I'll roll the kid and do T's and L's and do a lot of spine injury. And take the pants off. But yeah, if you can avoid cutting the clothes off, that's probably better because that will be less traumatic. I mean, the veins are the same. <laughs> they carry <laughs> blood and you put a tube into it. <laughs> and my last question, um, the lifespan of study that could have developed cancer on the CT, yeah. was that, that was over their entire life? or? That's, uh, that's Those studies were actually, so there's no good study to figure that out. That study was actually from atomic bomb data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki based on uh, cancers that, uh, based on radiation that those kids were exposed to, and cancers they developed over life. Um, we recently took care of a couple of kids who are No, I'm good. Uh, we, Is that right? No. No, right. That's, we, we have like 15, 20 minutes here. Right? Okay, good. Okay, so 10-ish, um, uh, you're over normal, I believe. Nine holds brother and sister. Uh, the patient that I took care of, we were concerned that she might have a seatbelt sign, um, and we did a fast that showed free fluid and got the new sets. Caveat was uh, kids were too soon to have adults, so we would expect free, some free fluid. Uh, so I just wanted to put that out there to see if that's accurate at all. Uh, or is that going to kill me better in the future? And then the other thing was that we didn't end up getting IV access on her uh, because uh, we attempted a couple times to start crying a whole lot and we, we just didn't do it. Right. Because we had already called Chad and knew that she was going to be transferred. And uh, we, you know, she had no more just to have a Right, I think, um, so there are a ton of kids, like this Johnny kid I put up, he would not have gotten, Ted Lousy wouldn't have gotten an IV in our trauma bay. There's a ton of kids that we don't start IVs on. I think a kid, uh, <coughs> I would, a kid with abdominal tenderness, I'd probably push to start an IV on. I mean, there's a chance they could have some sort of solid organ injury and become hypovolemic and maybe benefit from the But I mean, I mean, if you can't get it, you can't get it. And the Chetsy nurses, they're also they are the, also the people that we call to start heart IVs on the floor. So it's not unreasonable to wait for them. And then they can decide uh, if they want to try to start an IV before they get up and down. I think that's very important. Yeah. 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 It was fresh in his mind when he wrote a patient that raises it. He was basically comforting me. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to scan him. I'm not going to put him in. Oh, good like, for oh, him. <laughs> they do that there. They don't. They just observe him. And that's all right. Oh, Ellie, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, then I guess we'll just send him off. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And then other things in kids, littler kids, um, so the saphenous is a really good place to get an IV in little kids. Um, do you guys have uh, one of the vein finder things? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not down. What size do you? 22, 24. But you can use the vein finder on the saphenous and that's normally a slam dunk. It's a little easier to hold their leg, too. That would be somebody that you were clinically a lot more worried about that. Yeah, I mean, I think clinically, if you're worried. Yeah, I think a seatbelt sign, and a lot of this is my bias just from training in here, but that's a lot of force. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of those criteria that multi-center drive on. Yeah. 
I think it's reasonable to go to great lengths to try to get an ID and that kind of kid. I'm kind of a kid that looks pretty good, but it's a real bad car accident. My mom is all beat up and they're sick. Here. Maybe you can hold off on that kid. Just, just in a snapshot of that patient we look at. Another question somebody asked in the back end on this. But those are good questions. I mean, kids are scary, right? It's scary to have a kid roll in. You don't want to hurt the kid, and you don't know what you know applies to the kid. For the most part, it does. It's going to be that. You just want to pick them up like you're know, fine yeah, and not maintain any spine control. Right. But <laughs> first you, oh, also clearing C spine on a kid that can't follow commands. Yeah. So, in a kid that follows commands, and you can tell this to your uh, trauma dogs. So, a kid that follows commands, it's the same thing. So, a four year old that can follow, five year old follow commands, palpate their midline, if that's not tender, turn left, turn right, back, forward, if that's all fine, no pain, then you can take the follow. For a kid that can't follow commands, like two year olds, two years old or less, you just take the collar off and you just watch it. You just step back. <laughs> and you like rattle some keys over here, rattle some keys over there, see if they can turn their head, if they voluntarily, spontaneously do that, and then they're cool. I mean, any copy, but, but that's how you do it for, for a little baby. And that's it. And then you can pick them up. <laughs> I think that's always difficult when those little infants come into the trauma bank and we're not really certain how to get them out of the car seat. We right. pick them up, we hold them, and then we put them down, and somebody holds manual seat fine, and we've already kind of manipulated them around, so it's always a challenge. So that's yeah. the information. Yeah, I would just have somebody on the C spine and head, yeah. and somebody with the hands under the back and the, and the bottom, and just levitate the kids, slide the car seat out, and put the kid down. And you can, I, I, I normally do that once the car seat is on the trauma bed. Yeah. I normally transfer the whole kid over with the car seat onto the trauma bed. And then I let the MS get out of there. And then I let it do And then they just lay on the table? They just lay on the table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our trauma bay has a lot of people, with minimizing the amount of people who can do it, yeah. help. Because they, they're freaked out either way, when you're right? Ready, especially our heart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm a big fan of minimizing people in the trauma bay, as it is. And again, I don't know if that's just me growing up here, but if I identify people that are doing nothing in the trauma bay, I like I tell them to get out. It's just it increases the stress level. They're not. They're just taking up space. People, you know, we're going to get a smaller seat collar, and that person's like bumping into like ten people on the way to the fix this together. But you guys have, so what pediatric support do you guys have here? Though? I mean, you guys have, there's somebody on call from anest pediatric anesthesia at all times? Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. We have like a, a, a nurse summer. 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 Yeah. We have a pediatric CNS now, um, that she does peds, but not specifically trauma. Yeah. Um, just one. Them. She's on twenty four seven. No, she's not on twenty four seven. We have we can call the NICU for yeah. support. Um, is there they, still a NICU here? Yeah, it's yeah. coming back. Yeah, oh, they always have a provider on call. So that's perfect. Or in house, I should say, not on call. And then um, the ED charge nurse is now PALS certified, and they're doing pediatric code. So. Not to say that they have any yeah. more um, training than we do, right. but it's they're also an extra resource if we need. Right. Um, and some of the at ED least for IV starts or something yeah. like that. So and some of the ED docs here yeah. also work over at Rabies and our peds train too. So Paula Shannon, yeah. Matt Murray, I can't remember the other. I and think Paul always called out. works up in La Jolla a lot. Um, Paul is Oh, he does. He's moved on up to. The yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be afraid to like mobilize whatever resources you need to get an ID or figure out a med. You guys can always try calling. I have a question. What about medications in pediatric patients that are obese? Like we had a, I think she was a, like a ten-year-old girl 
yeah. who was um, a larger girl. And over 200 pounds. Over 200 pounds, yeah. yeah. And she was just wild. And do you guys get We normally like don't do it by ideal body weight. We normally do it by actual weight. Actual weight. Yeah, so up to like whatever the adult max is. Okay. So like, you're giving a man Seth. Well, like she needed Haldol and Versed and a whole bunch of stuff to like just chill out. Yeah, I would give her a standard five of Haldol okay. and give her a Judy, they always told me that you guys don't have Brazil press. They're telling me. Isn't it Yeah. Yeah, we don't use it. Yeah, they don't use all that stuff. We use, we, well, uh, we use, so in Houston we used it. We actually just lay it on the bed. And the kid, EMS dropped the kit off. We knew exactly what they were. It, um, at Rady, they have one of the ED docs like did some sort of study, and he has his own set of codes. Yeah. So we use that. But it's the same idea. It's similar to the same. Same idea. Right, this has been. <laughs> <laughs> you should mess this up. I do.